I believe the construction industry is one of the greatest places for people to go achieve personal success, either as an intrapreneur working within a business or as an entrepreneur owning a construction business. Like can hand on heart tell you it'll make a huge difference in your business if you can get the communication stuff dialed in both internally and externally and then collaboratively, like with all stakeholders involved and that kind of stuff. It's really quite transformative. Just because you change the mindset, you're just not all of a sudden a hundred million dollar business. Like you have to learn how to get from a million to two, three, four, five, and you learn new stuff. Welcome back to the site shed for round two. Hopefully we don't <laughs> screw this one up. When I say we, I mean me. Well, I, I, I'm sure it'll go awesome. Uh, <laughs> the conversation before, I guess, just ones that met for the public. Right. It was just too good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, for the you listeners and viewers out there, we did record this one a uh, couple of months back and then we had a tech failure at our end and here we are again re-recording. So thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Awesome, um, man. I'm glad to be here. But you're, and where are you tuning in from? Uh, Emerald, Iowa, North Carolina. Right on. Um, do you want to give us a 30,000 foot overview as to what you do, where you're from, why you do it, who you do it for, how you do it, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I got to the Marine Corps in 2010 and I found myself in residential construction. And I've done everything from running the jackhammer to running the company. And there was always one thing I could guarantee I would deal with, and that was a pissed off homeowner. And <laughs> I really got tired of getting my ass chewed in driveways. So I looked at it and was like, why? Why does this happen? Not just myself, but why does the construction industry have such a bad reputation when it comes to customer service? And everything I looked into brought me back to one thing, and that was communication. Communication breakdowns, either the customer didn't know what was going on, the guys didn't know what was going on. And when I showed up, typically I only had half the story and I couldn't have an intelligent conversation around what even happened on this project. So one night I was laying in bed, it hit me is if I just had software that worked as air traffic control and got all the right people talking to the right people, we could solve this for the entire construction industry. Uh, I went down the road of building that software. So I am now currently the founder and CEO of BuilderComs. And we're a construction communication platform that helps get your communication, your document management, your photos, your storage all in one place and simply organize them by project. But what I really do is I save you the time and hassle of going from email to text messages and not knowing what's going on making sure your guys know what they're doing when they're on that project by getting all that data in one place that once anybody looks into it, they can know what's going on in a project within a couple minutes. Sure. Yeah. No, it's, you know, I've always, I always say this to my team and to my clients, actually, you know, like the communication will solve 99% of your, of your problems. And it's those <laughs> disconnects between, the, all the different platforms out there like we see it internally or we did until we you know implemented our our version of like high level where we just centralize all of our communications and we do that for clients but like just being able to you know okay we're not doing text anymore we're not doing like well, we're, we're not sending in we're not calling off our phones we're not doing that <laughs> stuff we're just going to use a centralized system so that everyone can see what communications are happening internally and then there's no like discrepancies i mean even that like it sounds so simple but like it, it's it's amazing how much of a difference that can make. Yeah, it, yeah, that's the thing. And what I learned really quick about this problem is like we have way overcomplicated it. Like, yeah. it, it's we look at communication as being something really complex, really really hard, but it's actually really simple when you start breaking it down. If you just look at it as I need to get everybody in one place and get them talking to each other. Like that's the fundamentals of communication. And we make that one of the hardest things to happen because we, especially on projects, we have all these siloed conversations happening. 
yeah. where not all the right stakeholders are involved. Maybe it's a uh, uh, foreman and a uh, project manager having a conversation that the crew guys need to be able to see, or it's a homeowner having a conversation with the sales guy that should actually be happening with the scheduling department. And we don't get the right people having the right conversations. And it's, it's just simple. Like, that's what we have to do. No matter what you do is you have to just get that communications in one place. Like you said, we're not going to be doing this. We're going to do it this way and then just stick to it and do it. And you'd be surprised how quick it actually has a huge effect on your business. Sure. I'm not surprised at all, truthfully. I mean, I think the, like one of those biggest obstacles, you know, to overcome is the, well, no one told me this. Yes, I did. I told you back in blah, blah. No, you didn't. Like, just take it off the table. Um, and I guess with project-based work as well, like there's so many different stages which involve so many different stakeholders from preliminary through to, you know, construction, through to post, and all this kind of carry on. Like, you really do need that um, that dialogue happening in a way, in an ecosystem which involves uh, the people that need to see those conversations. What you you need that record. Thirty percent right. of construction projects end in a dispute, and they have, right. we have no record of any of this. So it's just a bunch of he said, she said. No one knows exactly what was promised or what was delivered or where we're at. If you start to create a record of this, like you were saying, from the very beginning of the project to the end and into the servicing, there's never a question. What was said, what was done, who's doing what. We like to say here at Buildercoms is if it doesn't happen in Buildercoms, it didn't happen. So you don't have, like, if you're out sending text messages and having private conversations, that stuff's not happening on the project. That is yeah. not being discussed where it should be being discussed. And these, that's the expectations you have to set. And it's not just for you as a construction business's benefit. It benefits the homeowner as well for them to be in there and for them to create a record of this communication. It, it's really a positive for all the parties involved. And I, 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 I know for certain there'd be a bunch of listeners or viewers hearing this right now going, oh man, that's the last thing I would want my, my clients seeing communications that relate to you know, the day-to-day -day running of a project. But I suppose the advantage of technology is you can give permission-based access on, you know, certain conversations, not every conversation, whereas WhatsApp, you can't really do that. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's one of the things I, is like, we, we have the ability to set admin settings, be able to have different stakeholders involved in different things from how you lay the projects out. A lot of guys have a customer facing project and then they also have the in-house project. So they're having different conversations with different people but the customer is getting what they need to see uh, and what documents, what communications. It's, it's the magic about software is just when it's simple, you can easily just bring the people that need to be in there in and leave the ones out that aren't. I think as well, like from the perspective of someone that, you know, runs like a business where we do have a need for dialogue. Like we, we always, like we set our clients up with Slack channels, right? So we can communicate with them. And it's, it's obviously very different vertical to what you guys are in, but like that, that for us is an important, such an important part of the piece because like with that dialogue and that regular conversation, we can always be on top of everything from, you know, the quality of leads that we're generating through to issues that might arise through the client sales processes, through all these different things, but without the dialogue and without the, the platform and that commitment to habit to keeping that dialogue going, it inevitably always falls over because you never really know what's going on. You never really know what's working and what might look green and you know glowing in a report could be a polar opposite when it comes to the actual, you know, on the other end from the client side. So it's just such an important piece of the puzzle for us. Yeah, no, I I agree one hundred percent agree with what you're saying. And as technology advances, having those dialogues, having these records, like I look at what we're going to do with AI in 2025, it's going to be insane. But the thing is, is like you have to have the ability to have 
creating these records, having these dialogues. Think about what it would be like if you had an entire year of your construction projects, of the communication, of everything that happened, that data right there can change the trajectory of your business. But right now what we're doing is it's everywhere. Buildercoms is the first platform that's come to your other to centralize this and get it all in one place. So we actually put companies in a position where they can collect all this data for once where it's not on somebody's cell phone, it's not in somebody's email, it's not in a Slack channel, uh, where you do not own your data in a Slack channel. That's, that's You just don't own it. And at Buildercoms, we empower you to own your information. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, it has been a crazy, I mean, you, you touched on sort of where it's heading, but like even you know, from when I went through and did my apprenticeship, you know, 20 plus years ago in the trades, you know, as a plumber, like the the, the communication and the, the ways that we, you know, collaborate with team members and clients and stuff like that has evolved just so in such a crazy way. Like, I mean, this is sort of, you know, talking about when mobile phones were just sort of becoming, you know, available to people like, oh, wow. And, and I, I tend to think, and I still tend to think some of these technologies have made people quite lazy. Like I remember reading in a book somewhere and it was <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, but it was along the lines of, you know, mobile phones or a, a, a disorganized person's way of getting organized sort of thing. Like it, it has to have it at your fingertips, but it's incredible how many people don't show up for meetings or don't, don't, don't like get these notifications and then miss the appointments and, you know, things like that. Like it's just this ongoing now evolution of technology, which people are sort of having to embrace if they want the outcome or they want to even be part of a conversation. And I think looking forward, you know, like the when you start involving things like artificial intelligence and all these kind of all these um, things that are evolving so rapidly at the moment, like it, the, we're, we're barely scratching the surface. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, and here, here's something: this this may or may not be a surprise to you, but like what we do now with our agency is we deploy a like a a, a managed bot system for the leads that we generate for clients. And we have bots do all of the work and the qualifications up to the point where one of our agents then goes and places the a qualified site visit into the calendars calendar. The bots do all the heavy work. And it's amazing because like they get yeah. all these leads. And it's the biggest problem, right? You get all these leads and people don't service them properly. And then, I mean, that's, that's one form of communication that's communicating sort of with cold traffic. But then we do it with re-engagement campaigns for databases, like just insane results. Like you, because people don't really do it, but you're using these technologies to sort of to aid not to replace but certainly to improve and aid and aid you know an existing existing process and it's just been a formidable change well it just gives like you said it does all the heavy lifting i mean that's the that's the part like technology should always be making you better like it, it should be a tool that makes you more efficient and makes you better at what you do like all go at yeah. builder comms is to make you the best communicator you possibly can be. That's by providing you a tool to do that and the resources to be the best communicator. Uh, what's amazing is what exactly what you were saying is like people miss these notifications. They don't look at text messages. They don't look at emails. My very first paid user in, in our conversation, he looked right at me and he said, hold on a minute, Ron. I don't think I have a communication problem. I think my clients have a communication problem. And I was like, that's interesting. Let's dive into that a little bit. And he goes, here's the deal is I communicate to these people and they don't respond to me. He's like, they think I'm a, I, they, they, they're not checking their emails. They think I'm a buddy wanting to have drinks after work. He's like, I think your software will add some proactiveness to their communication because he's like, I'm going to tell them when you get a builder comms notification, it's something that has to do with your project. And if you don't respond to that in a timely fashion, it's going to delay your project. Yeah. Two weeks later, he reached out to me and goes, I was right. It worked. He's like, my customers are now responding to me. When I send them a message because they're not getting, it's not an email. It's not a text message. It doesn't go to any of these other channels. It goes through builder comms and they get that notification 
and they know it has to do with their project. So he was able to take something that he felt was a strong point of his, but a weak point of his customers and flip it around to where now he's the hero again because he can get these projects done on a timely fashion because that's what he was running into. Projects were running over schedule because clients weren't getting back to him until 10 o'clock at night when he sends them a message at 8 a.m. And they lose an entire day because they have to have a decision made. And that right there is what happens when you talk about the people are just fatigued with their emails or their text messages to the point where they're not even checking it. So if you send them an email, what's the chances of them actually getting it in a timely fashion? Yeah, no, that's right. And, and it, it becomes, well, it certainly has for us where when, when we have conversations with clients. I mean, this is what I've learned over the years as well, Ron. You, you train your clients for better or worse. And this, and this is a conversation that I have with, with, you know, with, with all of our clients when they come over with us as well. I'm like, we need to get you away from your cell phone being the number one point of contact for your business because it's ruining your business and it's ruining your yeah. life. Like your phone just rings all weekend. And, but of course, the common objection is, yeah, well, that's great. But then we've got these, you know, project, these, these guys, these builders, the so-and-so, whatever, project managers, whatever it might be. And they only work with us because they can get direct access to me. And I always come back to them and I say, well, that might be the case, but you've trained them to do that. Like that's because you've, but that's just the way it's always been with you. It doesn't mean that it has to be that way forever. So it doesn't mean you can't offer excellent support. You just have to slightly do it, do it in a slightly different way if you don't want to be on the phone 24-7, you know. <laughs> and, so, and so and the reason I raise that point is because, you know, the, going back to what you were just saying then around um, the, the managing expectations, let's call it that, from, from the client side communications or we bring clients on board, we say to them definitively, this is how we communicate. If that's not okay, then don't come on board because we're not going to be calling and we're not going to be emailing and we're not going to be sending text messages like we use this platform because it centralizes everything and the whole team can access these conversations. And so it's it's part of their agreement when they come on board that they're okay with that as a, as a process, which simplifies everything. <laughs> yeah, no. It's, I mean, that's – but what, what you're talking about is exactly what we do in the construction space is we right. tell ourselves a story – of how it's always been and how it must be in the future, but that story is what hoards us back. Like, I'm, I, absolutely, absolutely. It's uh, and, and and for the better part, they're fallacies, right? Yep. I mean, I always talk about one of my really good mates who had a you know decent uh, glazier business, so it is glass and pool fences and you know frameless shower screens and balustrades and that kind of thing. Decent business, but he it never grew. And it never got past a certain point. And every time you have this conversation with him, it was always because, yeah, but you don't understand my business. And I can't get someone in to do it. And I'm not a coach, by the way. So like, it's probably not my role to say that. But I'm like, mate, you could do, you could scale this if you just did these things. No, 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 you don't understand. So he had these beliefs built into his own head, right? Which were preventing him and did prevent him inevitably from the business becoming much more than it ever, than it ever did. And it was all it was all manifestations internally, you know. Yeah, no, I, I 100% understand that. Like that's what we fight from the construction industry. Like that's yeah, that's the industry I'm trying to move into a different mindset. Like it's not that's like beyond even builder comms. Like in order for us to grow up and become the construction industry, we have to become to be able to do all of these projects, bring all of these people that need to be new coming into construction is we have to start going about it and start looking at it like we never have. And we can't tell ourselves the story we've always told ourselves because you know what? Labor has been a problem in construction since the day I started 15 years ago. Yeah, me too. It, it, and and it, 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 it looks like it's going to change. Yeah, it just continues like, but you, then the thing is, is some companies just figure it out. Like it took us a while. We figured it out. And you know what? We had a waiting list of people that wanted to work for us. Yep. But we stopped telling ourselves the story that nobody wanted to work in construction or that 
going and like this is just not an area where you can just have that kind of recruiting happening. It's all it's just what you tell yourself and what you believe. I believe the construction industry is one of the greatest places for people to go to go achieve personal success, either as a uh, intrapreneur working within a business or as an entrepreneur owning a construction business. There is so much success that can happen in the construction space. I don't understand why people wouldn't want to be part of it. So that's the story I tell myself. Well, I mean, and and you don't have to, I mean, so when I was, or perhaps when you and I were, you know, back venturing into the trades, you know, 20 odd, 15, 20 odd years ago, whatever it might've been, um, truthfully, I was never academic at school and it was almost like a default. I had to like, well, if you're not going to, uh, you, you're not going to do, you didn't do great at school, you're not going to do great at university, so you may as well go do a trade. Whereas now we're kind of seeing that flipped on its head where like, there were, you know, kids like, well, no, I want to. I, I'm, I am academic, I'm smart, whatever, but I still want to go and do a trade because it's no longer seen as like a fallback option. It's seen as like a really great way to make a significant impact. That's, I mean, that's because it is. I mean, I like, I just happened to fall into construction. Like when I got out of the Marine Corps, I was transitioning and trying to figure out like, what does the next chapter of my life look like? And I, I applied to a foreman and training role on Craigslist. Like, Oh yeah. It took me two weeks to even do that because I didn't think I had what it took to go be a foreman in training. And finally, one day I just like looked in the mirror and was like, Ron, you're a United States Marine. Like if you want to go work in construction, go work in construction. And the rest is history. Here we are having this conversation here today. Some of the smartest, brightest, best business owners I have ever met are in the construction space. They just happen to own a construction business. They would literally do the exact same thing anywhere else, but they chose construction and they just dominate it. I'm, I'm, my network recently has expanded quite a lot in um, some conversations that we're having with some big, big business, you know, and, and the conversation, and we're doing some podcasts on this coming up too. So keep an eye out for these you guys, if you, if you want to check this out, but the, the conversations are about how, you can build a trade business to the point where it becomes an asset which is acquirable at a multiple which far exceeds what you'd be used to getting over here in Australia, which you know is is typically because the the, business, the sizes of business over here when people want to sell them are quite small and they're relatively useless. Essentially, when people acquire business over here, they're buying databases which they can plug into their own marketing machine they might be borrowing some assets but often not because the trucks are normally trashed and uh, they might buy goodwill like the brand name and you know that kind of thing but they very rarely would take on any any liability or anything sort of that caliber but the direction that it is heading and the reason that i'm so bullish on this right now with guys is like there is a great exit strategy there for businesses which involves high returns which you guys are very familiar with over in the us like it's but you've been doing it for 15 years but i think at the moment it's kind of drying up over there like private equity is saying well i don't even know there's no there's nothing left to buy you know <laughs> over here it's sort of getting started right and everyone's like wow this is cool so i've got some colleagues of mine which are pioneering this and you know they'll they'd be set to exit their visit business uh, probably for about 150 million which is huge in australia and it's sort of the, be the first step of a of an avalanche effect over here i think once this gets going but the point I'm the reason I raise that is because like these guys are super fucking smart. Like they're not they're not monkey plumbers, you know, ask crack, <laughs> crack plumbers walking around with coffees in one hand and cigarettes in the other. They're smart business operators. Most of them have been through trades. They've built these huge businesses, and now they're you know looking at a way to you know wh- whatever the next stage looks like for them, which is is kind of exit, you know. Um, but you know, I've been in communications with colleagues in the States. One of the, one guy I'm chatting with, he's got like $100 million HVAC business in California. He's got a $50 million uh, mechanical business in uh, Texas. I think it was like, it's, it's just insane. You know, this, the size of these guys of, of the businesses and the way they think and the way they operate is just, it, it's so, so good to be around because it's so different to what we're sort of used to, you know, as, as, as a small business owner, you know? <laughs> Well, dude, man, that is super exciting that that's starting to happen in Australia uh, because it, it is great opportunity. You know what I tell people all the time is we're in business. 
We just happen to do construction. And the sooner people start to wrap their mind around that, instead of saying, oh, we're a construction business, we're, we're construction and business second, it's like your friend that was like, you don't, you don't understand my business. Well, I don't, the only reason you would say that is because you think you have this construction business that's different than everything else. But fundamentally speaking, it's just business. And if we would set out to build a business that delivers a construction service, it's changing that mindset. We're changing that story that we talked about that we're telling each other. So now we're businessmen mm-hmm. or businesswoman, whatever that looks like. And you, you, we just work in construction. And you can, yeah. you, that's how you build and scale this stuff. And, and, and then the shift becomes for the, for the business owner. It's the shift from becoming the tradesperson to becoming the business owner. And the things, like I was talking to a, co- a colleague of mine just on the weekend. Um, he's, he's in the uh, like meat, meat trading industry. So they basically, you know, sell, sell and uh, list meats and stuff like that internationally around whatever. And he's talking about going out on his own. He's a very good salesman, this guy. And he was sort of asking, you know, what's involved, would have been involved in setting up my own thing. And I was just saying to him, look, you, you need to understand all like you're great with the sales hat right now but then if you take that hat off and you put an hr hat on what does that look like (laughs) or if you take the hr hat off right now and you have to go put on a marketing hat what does that look like or you know customer relations you know insert you know vertical uh, department here sort of thing and so i think the the onus really at at some point when when you decide okay well you know this is i do want to become a business owner you've got to learn business i don't teach you they don't teach you these things at trade school, right? They, they don't teach you any of this stuff. They don't, well, private equity, what the hell is that? You know what I did at business school when I did my plumbing apprenticeship? They taught me how to write a business letter. Like they taught me how to write the, the address on a fucking envelope, right? Like, <laughs> unbelievable. So, I mean, I'm sure that, well, I, I hope that's changed. I mean, in fairness, I suppose to the system, they can only fit so much into a curriculum. But the point I'm trying to make is, you know, if you want the outcome, you've got to go and do the thing and you've got to take those steps to go and learn that stuff you know, on your own, because it's not going to come and land in your lap. And if you want to be a hundred million dollar business, then you've got to start thinking like a hundred million dollar business. You know, you can't keep trading like a million dollar business. Very different. So it is, it's, I mean, it's a huge difference and you're 100% on point where like this doesn't just happen just because you change the mindset. You're just not all of a sudden a hundred million dollar business. Like you have to learn how to get from a million to two, to three, to four, to five, and you learn new stuff. And it's all those different hats that you were just talking about is like what we have to learn, but we don't have to be the absolute best at it. Like we just have to understand it. And then you go find the person that's the best at it and hire them and give them the guidance and coach them to be great at what they're doing. That's, that's why when we talk, like, being great at the trades is absolutely awesome. I love that I was so good at what I did. But what I was really good at was learning stuff and understanding stuff. That's how I got really good at my trade. Mm-hmm. We just apply that to business. Like you have to look at it like you're back in an apprenticeship, but you own the damn company and you're apprenticing on how to become the best business owner you possibly can. Yeah, absolutely. And I really just want to I, I drive home. I know we touched on it already, but I think it's super important for the guys out there that if you're listening to this and you might be thinking, oh, yeah, this sounds good, but like it's just another thing for our clients to have to do and like whatever. I, the, the paradigm I, I just want, I would challenge you on is um, like if they're coming to you for a project, say they want a renovation or a building project done or whatever it might be, the, it, you can't avoid the fact that it's going to be done in a way that's going to inconvenience people. <laughs> like you can't build a freaking house without it being an inconvenience, right? So maybe adding an app to their phone or whatever it might be, might be another inconvenience, but it will, in the interest of simplification, and if you communicate the reasons why you want to streamline these communications, it will work in your favor a lot. And it, and it will become what, what we define as your unique mechanism, like it becomes part of your process. 
and it's what like it's and and when you when you're talking like if I, i've got my marketing hat on here but you know when you're trying to um position yourself as uh to stand out from your competitors like what's your point of difference some of these processes that you adopt within your business are part of your unique mechanism and the reason that people will gravitate towards that is because you're using something that other people won't, which has a direct implication on the way a project runs. And you can, and if, if you can communicate those things, the advantages and the pros and those, you know, whatever, then that's a, that's a really powerful tool and a really powerful and a really good point of leverage. Yeah. And that's what the, that's the systems that we're talking about that private equity love. Yeah. Like they want stuff right. that just does that you have systems that you built, yeah. you know, when it comes to communication, the word, like the, the worst excuse that you can give me for why you're not, why you want to use builder comms is like, it, it would be an inconvenience yeah. right now. The way we communicate as an industry is an inconvenience Correct. and communication is a necessary when it comes to a project, this is something you're going to do no matter what. So when you consider it an inconvenience, I look at it as there's probably a reason why you feel that way. And it's probably because you're not doing the best job you could communicating with your customers in something like builder comms is going to bring accountability to that. Mm -hmm. And what I say is don't be scared of that because that right there is what's going to free you and free you to go out there and deliver the experience that you want to deliver for your customers. I think for the better part, people that are listening to this, you know, this podcast are out there because they want to find new and better ways of doing things, right? So we, in a way, kind of preaching to the choir, but the, the uh, you know, there, there's that, there is that huge mindset. And I, I don't know if it's necessarily in the trades because that's where I spend all my time. So that's my exposure. But like there is that, well, it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of mentality. And that's a dangerous and a very slippery slope because you never really get exposure to things which can, you know, really have that transformative effect if you, with, with that kind of attitude. But yeah, I think I certainly speaking from experience with, you know, using technologies and things like that, even like Slack channels, like it's just been such an easier way to simplify communications with clients and hold, hold them accountable, you know, because like that's a reality too. Like, like you were saying before, you know, you can't send a message at 10, 8 o'clock in the morning and not get a response until 10 at night. Like if it's something that's got to be done, like you could hold up the entire project. Like those kind of things you need to be able to, you know, hold your clients accountable to, you know, so that they're as, as, much, as, as much involved in the process as you are when it comes to doing what needs to be done. And again, it's not always going to be convenient. <laughs> Tough shit. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it typically isn't going to be convenient. And, you know, rework costs the construction industry over $30, million, or $30 billion a year. And most of that is directed back at miscommunications throughout the project that lead to that rework. So mm -hmm. when you're thinking about it, what is it really costing you to not be clearly communicating in setting these expectations because if somebody's not getting back until 10 o'clock at night how many guys did you just have sit on a job site what did that cost you or what did it cost you in lost opportunity because now that project's ran over that's what patrick was running into was he wasn't he kept having to move out his nets projects and he was pissing off homeowners before he even showed up at their house and he was able to fix all of that just by setting clear expectations and using a simple tool to communicate with his homeowners mm. awesome well yeah look i mean I, I feel like we could go on for days talking about this sort of stuff truthfully but um i would just say to you guys out there if you're on your fence try it i know now ron correct me if i'm wrong you guys are now this the uh, builder comms is running in australia uh yep and, and you're feeling like guys guys are good to Go, jump on the trial and give have a play with it correct yeah absolutely jump on there try it out the app everything's live yeah. in australia we have people boots on the ground using it on a daily basis great so i'm going to put some links guys in the show notes 
Um, so when you see this come through, when you hear it on audio, whatever, head across to the sideshow.com, just type in Ron and um, you'll be able to uh, find his this recent podcast with all the links to that sort of stuff. But go check it out. Like you've got nothing to lose. Um, I, like, I can hand on heart tell you it'll make a huge difference in your business if you can get the communication stuff dialed in both internally and externally and then collaboratively, like with all stakeholders involved and that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's really tr quite transformative. Um, now, and Ron, this isn't, um, Buildercoms isn't designed to replace job management or project management, is it? It sort of works in collaboration with existing programs that guys are already using. Yeah, we're, we're designed to pick up where project management software falls off. Yeah. And that's in the communication piece. So yeah, we're, we're designed to work right alongside any of that stuff that you use. Yeah, great. Okay. So yeah, it's just purely based around the communication side of things, tidying that all up and then getting your, you know, your suite or your ecosystem of tools and software or tech stack, whatever you want to call it, like just all, um, you know, all working together. Mate, great chat. Love it. Um, definitely let's keep, keep in, um, keep in contact see where this heads up. I'm very interested to see uh, what, what the roadmap looks like looking forward. I mean, you sort of alluded to it a little bit before. What, what, what is on the, what is on the roadmap? <laughs> so uh, we, my commitment to the construction industry is to deliver the best communication solution out there. And we're going to continue to do that with the advancements in AI. Like I said, if you start to think about not just being the tool, but also taking an inherently group that are bad communicators. Like I suck at spelling. I suck at grammar. I suck at all this stuff. Now we can provide a tour to help people put their best messages forward as well. So in 2025, with the help of AI, we're going to start to not just be able to extract data from builder comms, to be able to go in and ask pinpointed questions on, hey, what are people saying? or give me your top five objections or project complaints. If you thought to think about being able to have that kind of data that's non-biased. And then also the ability to, every time you hit send, you know that that is the best message going forward for that homeowner, whether you're sending it, a crew guy is sending it, a management or superintendent is sending that message. You're always sending the best stuff. So. We're also getting ready to roll out integrations. That's going to happen a lot faster uh, than the AI stuff. But yeah, when I say we're a work alongside tool is we're just going to integrate with everybody. I, yeah, I believe yeah. that's how construction software should work. I 100%. I couldn't agree more. And this is so many, you'll never truthfully find one tool that does everything 100% the way you want it. And I think technology as a whole, like the future in technology is the ability to integrate. And, you know, we see this now, you know, is when we deploy our, you know, the high level accounts for clients and stuff like that. The ones that don't, the project management, job management tools that don't have an API, they're a nightmare to work with. And we just, we just tell the clients change. Like if you want this, you have to change. And there's mm -hmm. some tools out there that refuse, I'm not going to name names, but they refuse to, um, you know, build API. And I suppose in their defense, their argument towards that is simplicity. And it's like, well, we do our thing very well. And truthfully, they do. But at the point where, you know, you do want to scale and you need to integrate, like it, it's such a bottleneck to be put in that position where you're so heavily in, invested into a tool and all of a sudden you're like, well, now we're going to go on to another one purely because this one doesn't talk to anything. Like, I think it's just insanity. But anyway. Well, that's the story that construction tech tells itself is that we can't we can't all work together but i meet with builders and contractors every week and that's what they want like yeah. they just want to be able to pick and choose the tours that work best for, the, for their business and they want us all to talk to other like that's yeah. the future yeah. of construction software that's that's like builder comms is going to be at the epicenter of this because i'm committed to this it's building that where everything just talks to each other and like, that's how it should be. And that's what the construction industry wants. And it's not competitiveness. It's about creating a win for that contractor or builder. Cause the industry is big enough for a lot of us to be around and to have a huge impact. Uh, I, I think that mindset and I, yeah, there's, there's companies out there that absolutely will refuse to do it, to work with anybody else. And you know what? They buy up a bunch of software and they just kill it. 
stuff that could actually impact the industry because they look at it as being a being competitive. And I think that's what's going to change. I, I think there's eventually going to be, I use Salesforce as a terminology because that's the closest thing I can think of of what the construction industry needs is like a Salesforce where there's all these tours and you pick and choose what you want to use. And it, but the, the magic is, is they all talk to others. So like if you're using go high level, it talks with everything yeah. and all your other tours and you never have to worry about it. And that's how it's going to work with builder comms is whatever you use, we're this communication tool that can feed information back and forth in invite everywhere. Yeah, it's good. Oh, well, look forward to that. Roll up, roll on the API. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, listeners, viewers, um, I'll put, as I mentioned, some links to everything to, to Ron and to, um, to Builder Comms. And I think we've got a unique link in there somewhere or other as well. So you guys can go grab hold of that offer. Uh, but go check it out for sure. Um, and if you've got any questions or if there's anything you, we didn't cover, uh, let us know. I'm sure I could coax Ron to coming back in the sh on the show for the third time and uh, <laughs> <laughs> answering some of those. But, um, Ron, thanks so much for your time. Um, appreciate it as always. And uh, yeah, really, really good conversation. Awesome, man. Thank you. I enjoyed it. All right, listeners and viewers, that is a wrap. New Zealand-based home renovation company, 6,593% ROAS. Sydney-based solar company, 2,700% ROAS. Hunter region-based bathroom renovation company, 5,616% ROAS. Melbourne-based building company, 13,182% return on ad spend. Adelaide-based solar company, 2,881% return on ad spend. Guys, the list goes on and on. If you were a trade-based business, and you work with projects like roofing, solar, bathroom renovations, kitchen renovations, anything like that, head across to tradey.wiki forward slash pod for podcast. tradey.wiki forward slash pod for podcast. Book in a conversation. It is game changing.